It is now time for oral questions. Point of order. Point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to call to the attention of all members to the fact that Saturday, October 24th, is Brain Cancer Awareness Day. I ask this House to join me in recognizing all those who have been impacted by brain cancer. We send our heartfelt support to those affected and to the wonderful health teams that are supporting them during this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, it is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you. Speaker, my first question this morning is for the Premier. Families who lost loved ones in long-term care during COVID-19, the pandemic, have lived with pain and heartbreak that is unimaginable. And this week, the Premier added to their pain by exempting himself and long-term care homes from legal liability for their failure to protect seniors in long-term care. Yesterday, the Premier dismissed families' concerns, claiming, and I quote, that they had only read the headlines. Why would the Premier insult families in expressing outrage and frustration by claiming that they're just not smart enough to understand the government's bill? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise again today and answer the same question in the same way. What this does not do, what the bill does not do, does not protect bad actors against claims related to gross negligence or intentional misconduct related to the inadvertent transmission of COVID. It does not interfere with employee rights as they relate to WSIB or supporting legislation. What it does do is targeted, enhanced civil liability protection for volunteers, for workers, for nonprofits, for businesses, for charities, for the people who are on the front lines in our communities, who want to engage in our communities, who have been engaging in our communities, Mr. Speaker. This bill supports our communities in so many sectors and look forward to expanding in the second question. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, families have actually read the bill, and they know exactly what this Ford government is up to. Darlene Thomas wrote us to say, and I'm going to quote Darlene, I am disgusted and appalled reading this bill. My grandmother died alone under deplorable conditions at Orchard Villa. Now the government wants to protect these companies. Where is the justice? So why is the Premier more interested in protecting himself and the for-profit long-term care chains than allowing Darlene and thousands like her to have some, some justice and accountability for what happened to their loved ones? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and as I was reading some of the coverage, I, Steve Berman, who's a lawyer and, and running some of the some of the cases that have already mm -hmm. been launched, and, and if you read his comments in the paper, I don't think he has any concern at all that his cases are in jeopardy of of meeting the standard that we're putting out to protect the the, the people in the front lines, the people contributing to our communities, to the nonprofits, the businesses, to to the many other. What this legislation does not do is protect bad actors. Bad actors need to be aware. If they are failing to provide the necessities of life, if they're deliberately ignoring public health advice, they're, or they're just not taking public health advice, if they're fraudulent, or they're, they're, they're unlawful confinement, or assault, or battery, all of those things can still be pursued, Mr. Speaker. What we're doing is Response. providing a standard of, of protection for those who are contributing to our communities, doing so in good faith with an honest belief, Mr. Speaker. The final supplementary. Speaker, Matt Smith Johnson of Scarborough lost his grandfather in March and writes this. This clearly leaves an open door for long-term care corporations to simply claim, quote, we thought we were doing the best we could when we can all see that they are not. This shifts the burden of proof onto the victims, and that's what Matt Smith-Johnston had to say. So my question is, when will this Premier finally admit that these families are not ignorant, as he suggests, that they have actually read the bill, and they simply refuse to sit by while the Premier rewrites the law to protect himself and to protect the long-term care chains that failed to protect our loved ones? Attorney General. I, I, I've, I've heard the Leader of the Opposition say it three times now, but I think what was said yesterday was that I didn't think that she had read the bill. Yeah. 
and I'm fairly certain that she hadn't, because the things that she followed up with through successive questions clearly do not get captured in the bill. She's talking about alleging things that are gross negligence. She's alleging things that are that are over the top. What we're talking about, what the bill talks about, is protecting those people, like the PSWs, the frontline workers, the grocery clerks, the charities, the nonprofits, the people who are contributing to our communities, the people who are nervous about volunteering at their local sports organizations. What we're talking about is just with an honest belief and a good faith effort, they're engaging their communities as we want them to do to help us rebuild Ontario and help us recover together. The next question, again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier, but I have to say it's doubly disgusting that the government's trying to use uh, these, uh, these folks as a shield against the criticism they're getting for this nasty bill. For days, the Premier has denied the fact that his legislation has one goal, and that goal is to protect the Ford government and for-profit long-term care homes from liability in terms of the Order. failure to protect the seniors that were in their care. The 20 lawsuits that have been filed during this pandemic aren't targeting uh, paramedics, and they're not targeting hockey coaches. They're demanding justice from this Ford government and long-term care chains that made millions while seniors suffered in their care. That's what this is all about. If the Premier is sincere when he cl claims that he wants to provide accountability, if Question. the minister is sincere, then will they exempt the Ford government and private long-term care homes from the legislation? Here, here. The Attorney General. Is the Leader of the Opposition sincere in demonizing the good actors, in demonizing the people who are in good faith, taking public health advice, implementing it? Is she demonizing the PSWs who are doing work every day, the cooks in the kitchens, the people Order. who are helping them, the people who are putting themselves out there, let alone the people who are nervous about coming forward to help in our communities. Is that the effect that she wants, Mr. Speaker? I cannot believe that I'm hearing her say, throw our workers in harm's way when they're making a, best, a good effort, an honest effort, good faith. Order. Mr. Speaker, we are protecting the people of Ontario so they can contribute to our communities like we're asking them to do to help us recover Ontario as we go through COVID-19, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I would say not at all. In fact, I'm not even demonizing this Ford government. They're doing it all themselves quite well, Speaker. And by the way, the minister needs to know that the person he was quoting in terms of the lawsuits says this, we are puzzled why the government has promised to protect nursing home residents at all costs, is now focused on passing legislation that will only protect nursing home operators, their shareholders, and their insurance companies. But the fact is, since this pandemic began, the premier has bent over backwards to protect the vested interests in long-term care, whether it's Mike Harris sitting on the board of Chartwell or the small army of Ford government staff now lobbying for for-profit long-term care chains to be protected, connected. Conservatives know that the Ford government will rewrite the law to ensure that they avoid any accountability. So if the Premier wants to prove otherwise, there's a simple solution. He can exempt the Ford government and these for-profit chains from this legislation. Question. Will he do the right thing? Yeah. The Attorney General to reply. I'd be curious to know if the Leader of the Opposition took my suggestion yesterday and got a second legal opinion from the Attorney General of BC, the NDP Attorney General, who brought in very similar legislation. Or, and I should have thought of this yesterday, but I didn't, but here, you know, she could phone the Attorney General of Nova Scotia, who a Liberal government, so if she doesn't trust the NDP government in BC, she could phone the Liberal government in Nova Scotia and talk about the Minister's directive there. It's very similar. We are protecting the front lines. We are protecting the people who are nervous about the inadvertent transmission of COVID. This does not provide any level of protection for criminal behavior, for gross negligence, for, for you know, not providing the necessities of life, deliberate failure of standard of care. This doesn't help those bad actors one little bit. In fact, it helps Spons? us get to them and make sure that they pay the price for their bad actions. Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker, who I don't trust is this Ford government, and neither do the families in Ontario who 
were devastated when they lost their loved ones in long-term care. Residents in long-term care and their families deserve so Order. much better than what this government's offering up. After promising an iron ring, after promising accountability, the Premier refused to make the investments needed to protect seniors in the midst of the pandemic, and he has refused to call a public inquiry as well. But he is now literally rewriting the law to protect himself and for-profit corporations and long-term care chains from liability. Why is he re rewriting the law, Speaker? Why is he writing the, re rewriting the law to protect himself and those chains from, uh, from the profits that they make, Speaker? They should be held accountable. These chains make a lot of money Question. off of our long-term care system. Why is he protecting them and not the seniors that they are supposed to be caring for? Attorney General. Now we're getting to the nub of it, Mr. Speaker. If you make money, you're a bad guy. That's where it comes from. Well, I'm focused on the people who are volunteering their time. I'm focused on the people who are going to work every single day, putting themselves at some risk. I'm focused on the people who are in our communities, fighting for our communities, helping Ontario to recover. We are in unprecedented times, unprecedented Order. times. We are Order. looking at those sectors and saying, whether it be agriculture, colleges and universities, whether it be the volunteer sector, the charity sector, there's so many people. We need people in the food banks helping those who need it the most, and the NDP would have us throw them under the bus. It is shameful, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for York Southwestern. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Aaron Porter is a York Southwestern resident and TTC employee. On October 4th, Aaron felt unwell, was told to stay at home and get a COVID test. He got the test two days later, but Aaron only received his results two weeks after by phone. It was negative, thankfully. Like many workplaces, Aaron was asked to bring physical copy of the test results. He could not get it online and the telephone number he was provided was automated. Aaron could have returned to work sooner if he received his test results. This antiquated system makes it difficult for containing the spread of COVID and for an economic recovery. Premier, where is the plan to address the rest delays that specifically hurt my community? Minister Health. Well, thank you very much. I thank the member very much for the question, and I'm assuming that you are speaking about the situation at the Humber River Assessment Centre, where there were some uh, people who were experiencing delays in receiving their results. However, that situation has been resolved. Ontario Health has been working with the centre, and they have put in uh, measures to make sure, mitigation measures, to make sure that this situation doesn't happen again. But people are now able to receive the results online. There was a glitch in the system but it has now been resolved. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question again is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, my riding is a hotspot. That means residents like Aaron, many whom are essential workers and provide a vital service, are at high risk of getting COVID. We need reliable local community-based testing with quick return turned around for test results. I would like to remind the Premier what the Health Minister said yesterday in the Toronto Star. She said, and I quote, if there is a need, and it sounds as if there is in your community, we will do whatever we can to get the resources there. Well, Mr. Speaker, there is a clear need, and my community has mm. been begging for the province help for months. The health leaders in my community, from Humber River Hospital to the community health centres, are doing their best. Question. But we need more resources. Can the minister tell Aaron and other residents of York Southwestern that we will get local community-based testing and timely results, Mr. Speaker? Minister. Yes, I can tell the gentleman that, and I can tell all of the members of your community that we are responding to that need. We have recognized that there are certain communities in Toronto area and the GTA that have greater needs and that they can't all be resolved through the assessment centres. And in fact, we have 15 completed or planned community testing events 
that are taking place in the uh, North Etobicoke Malton Woodbridge area. Uh, many of them have already taken place, but I can tell you that October 14th, 15th, and 17th, there were assessment centres that were opened in Rexdale. October 24th and 31st, November 7th, there will also be additional testing centres that are opened in uh, Rexdale as well. So we are responding to the need. We recognize that there needs to be some mobile, some pop-up testing in certain areas. And as we said yesterday, as I said yesterday, if there is a need, we Response. will respond to it, and we are responding Great to it. Day. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. As we all know, the previous Liberal government failed to act when the people of Ontario asked for a more effective and user-friendly recycling program. For the last 15 years, while the previous Liberals and their new leader, Del Duca, were in power, Ontario's diversion rate stalled at just 30 per cent, and we saw them make no effort to modernize a program that was no longer working for the people of our province. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians have suffered under the Liberal piecemeal Blue Blocks framework long enough, and it is about time that a government showed true leadership on this issue. It is easy for the opposition to say that we are not doing enough to help the environment, but the progress we have already made to improve a system that was so irresponsible, neglected under the previously government, suggests otherwise. Mr. Okay. Speaker, this past government showed time and time again that they were not able to make the far-reaching changes necessary to finally give Ontarians the Blue Blocks program they need and deserve. So, can the Minister of Environment... Thank you. Thank you. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member from uh, Mississauga Streetsville for that excellent question. And I'm pleased to give this response, Mr. Speaker. Our government is committed to implementing a blue box program that is easy and accessible for all Ontarians and one that will work to achieve the highest target waste diversion in North America. It is my commitment, Mr. Speaker. As Minister, that once transitioned, the Blue Box program will continue to be convenient and accessible to all people of Ontario. This includes municipalities with populations under 5,000. If you had a Blue Box uh, curbside collection system prior to the transition to producer responsibility, Mr. Speaker, you will continue to have it after the transition to producer responsibility. In fact, Mr. Speaker, producers will have to ensure that more communities, including Spons? Northern Ontario and Indigenous communities, have some form of service. Mr. Speaker, I announce a proposal will expand the program to apartment buildings, long-term care homes, retirement homes, schools, municipal parks. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. The people of this province were continually ignored by the previous government, and it's frustrating to see that nothing significant was ever done to provide Ontarians with a more convenient and consistent recycling options. By not working to modernize the blue box, what the Liberals did was effectively ignore the amount of waste that was going into our landfills. The opposition love to endorse headlines alluding that the government is ditching recycling, yet in their own environmental plan, they actually say, quote, the most efficient way to reduce emissions from waste is to divert it from landfills, end quote. Ontarians deserve more than this rhetorical whiplash. What they need is a government that will put the work, the consultation, into re uh, to create a system that actually works for the people of this Question. province and one that diverts more waste from landfills. So can the Minister of Conservation and Parks provide members of this House an effective minimizing the amount of material that ends up in our landfills? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Ontarians divert almost 50 per cent of the residential waste through the Blue Box program. Uh, green bins or, or composters in their backyards. Unfortunately, when you factor in the waste from other resources such as commercial and industrial, the diversion rate drops to about 30 per cent. That means that about 70 per cent of all total waste generated in our province ends up in landfills, and it's stayed that way for the past 15 years. This represents a significant loss in economic opportunities when potentially valuable resources are thrown in the trash. 
We need to do better, Mr. Speaker, and that's why our Made in Ontario Environment Plan established our waste diversion programs on the producer responsibility model. Making producers responsible for the waste associated with their products and packaging will spur innovation from producers. And in the case of the Blue Box program, Mr. Speaker, we'll provide up to $135 million Funds? per year in relief for municipalities and ultimately the taxpayer. Mr. Speaker, we're expanding the list going into the blue box. We're standardizing the list so people will know throughout Ontario what goes into the blue box, and we're expanding the Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. My question is to the Premier. A growing chorus of anti-hate experts and concerned citizens are raising serious concerns about the Premier's decision to quietly sneak, sneak provisions giving Ford ally Charles McVady the power to grant university degrees at Canada Christian College. Yesterday, the Premier said, and I quote, he went through the process like every other college and the process is independent. Unquote. However, CBC News today reports that Canada Christian College has not actually completed this process at all, Mr. Speaker. Why would the Premier of Ontario make such a completely untrue claim? To ask the member to withdraw her unparliamentary remark. Questions have been placed. The parliamentary assistant will reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All private uh, post-secondary institutions in Ontario require a thorough and rigorous organizational review in order to change names, expand degree granting authority. This review is undertaken by the independent Post-Secondary Education Quality Assessment Board. We look forward for the review. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. However, McVady has a well-documented record of crossing the line into hate speech. In 2006, he was kicked off of a Christian broadcast channel for suggesting that LGBTQ people prey on children and that Haitians practice Satanism. On Twitter, McVady has called the Islamic faith a war machine and even invited Garrett Wilders, a notorious anti-Islamic political leader, to speak at Canada Christian College, saying that Canadians should come to the campus to learn about the threat of demographic jihad. That, this is the school that the Ford government wants to make into a university. Will the Premier admit today, will anybody on that side of this House admit today that this was not the result of an independent process? This is an attempt to do a favour for a political ally. Will you stop this reckless plan today? Thank you. Members will take their seats. The parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, it's the Post-Secondary Education Quality Assessment Board that reviews programming. One of the reasons we have a high-quality education system across the province of Ontario is because we lean on the expert advice of the Post-Secondary Education Quality Assessment Board. BCAP is made up of independent experts and individuals with significant expertise and experience in the education sector. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question today is for the Minister of uh, Colleges and Universities. Mr. Speaker, let me say I, uh, you know, I appreciated the other day the comments of the Premier about my trailblazing role as the first woman, an openly lesbian, openly gay Premier of Ontario. So, Speaker, I wonder then if the Minister could confirm for us that he supports the inclusion of all Ontarians, regardless of race, religion, sexual orientation gender, socioeconomic status, ability, or ethnicity in his vision of a strong, thriving post-secondary system. The parliamentary assistant to reply. Thank the member opposite for her question. Um, in my previous career, I worked internationally, and one of the reasons youth from across the globe choose Ontario is because of the high quality of our post-secondary education system. Regardless of background, they choose Ontario because programming is of a high quality, because, Mr. Speaker, we rely on the expert advice of the Post-Secondary Education Quality Assessment Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Sure. I appreciate at least part of that answer, but now I ask that the minister explain to the legislature and to the people of Ontario, particularly to people in the LGBTQ plus community, young people who are questioning their sexuality, children who are being raised in loving gay and lesbian families, 
why this government would extend the mandate of the most publicly and vocally homophobic man in Ontario. Why, in the name of all that is decent, would this minister validate the hateful, vicious, racist, and homophobic Order. rhetoric of Charles McPhee by extending the reach of his Canada Christian College? As Reverend Michael Corrin wrote yesterday in iPolitics, and I quote, for many people, Charles McPhee is Canada Christian College, unquote. Why then would this government grant such an organization run by a man who rejects science and evidence and is on the record espousing hate to grant university degrees in science and in arts. Is this actually happening because of McVitie's support during Question. the 2018 election campaign? And if so, how will Conservative members explain their actions to the young people living in fear of homophobia in their constituents? Members will take their seats. Assistant to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of the world-class education system, the inclusive world-class education system we have in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, when we develop programming to respond to the labour market needs of this province, it is done with the independent assessment. Order. With the independent order. Parliamentary assistant, please conclude. With the independent assessment of the Post-Secondary Education Quality Assessment Board, Mr. Speaker, it's been going on for the past 20 years in the province of Ontario, and we will continue to have a world-class education system that welcomes the world to Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. The next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the summer, and actually, over the last few weeks, uh, I've been meeting with small businesses across my riding. In fact, last night I had a roundtable with a number of businesses. Consistently, they support the actions of this government, and at the same time, they keep asking us, can we give them more help, offsetting the high cost associated with PPE? Can the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction provide greater clarity on how the Main Street Recovery Act will help small businesses address this concern? And does the minister have any indication if the other parties in this House will support small businesses by helping pass this legislation? The parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Peterborough Kawartha for the question. Mr. Speaker, small and Main Street businesses are the backbone of Ontario's economy, and our Main Street Recovery Plan was designed based on over a hundred virtual meetings roundtables and discussions, and more importantly, Mr. Speaker, the largest ever stakeholder consultation in the history of this province. Now, the plan draws from across government and builds on more than $10 billion in urgent economic relief provided through the COVID-19 Action Plan. It also includes the Main Street Recovery Act, proposed legislation that would modernize rules to help small businesses and programs like the $1,000 Main Street Recovery Grant to fund PPE. Mr. Speaker, Response. Ontario's small business strategy completes the plan. It's a long-term framework that will help small businesses rebuild, reinvest and grow. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I'm not surprised, but I am disappointed to hear that the other parties don't want to help small businesses with the high cost of PPE. Okay. Ironically, the leader of the Liberal Party on the campaign swing through Guelph heard the top issue facing small businesses there was, wait for it, assistance with PPE. Now, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal leader has criticized the Premier for spending time this summer meeting with Ontarians. He referred to it as campaigning. Yet, when Mr. Del Duca had his tour, it was leadership is in this day and age, actually talking to people in their communities. A little bit of a discrepancy there. Leaders in the House, or sorry, Liberals in the House, demand further closures and restriction measures. But at a recent nomination meeting in Halton, they stacked a room. Parliamentary assistant can respond. Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. Mr. Speaker, 
Our government and our leader recognizes the devastating impact that COVID-19 is having on businesses and people right across Ontario. But our government has a plan to modernize regulations and to reduce unnecessary burdens to help more people and businesses recover from the economic effects of COVID-19 and to prepare them for the opportunities of the future. The Better for People, Smarter for Business Recovery Act will help build a government that works for the people of Ontario through the pandemic and beyond. Mr. Speaker, our government is creating the right economic environment that will allow people and businesses to focus on recovering, rebuilding and re-emerging from this crisis stronger than before. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, once again, the Premier is shamelessly using the pandemic to push through legislation that is driven by his own agenda and that will do absolutely nothing to help Ontario recover from COVID-19. The government's meddling in local decision-making by scrapping ranked ballots came as a complete surprise to Ontario municipalities, especially London, the only city to have used this voting system. London's leadership in running a successful ranked ballot election in 2018 has been recognized across Canada. But the Premier's interference means that not only are the one-time expenses in tabulator algorithms, additional auditors and voter education now lost, but the city will face new costs to revert back to first-past-the-post. Speaker, how exactly does overriding local democracy and forcing London to abandon ranked ballots save municipalities money? The, the member for Milton, the parliamentary assistant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the member opposite for that important question. Mr. Speaker, it is important that the way people vote in the federal election and the way people vote in the provincial election is the same way that people vote in the municipal election. Our government is committed to enhancing consistency in all elections, Mr. Speaker. That's why earlier this year we responded to a request by the Chief Electoral Officer of Ontario and made changes to create a single voter list, Mr. Speaker, that would be used both in the municipal and in the provincial elections. As noted by the Chief Electoral Officer, this change was in intended to reduce the need to make corrections on Election Day, shorten wait times, and save municipalities money, especially during some of the most difficult times that we're going through right now, COVID-19, where resources could be put to use in other areas to help local constituents. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Kingston and the Islands. Speaker, upon hearing of the government's surprise move to end ranked ballots, the mayor of Kingston said this. I'm disappointed for the residents of Kingston who spent time and effort in 2018 learning about ranked ballots, understanding the differences in that system, weighing out the advantages and disadvantages, and ultimately casting a vote for what they thought was best. Yesterday, the Premier said that these ballots were confusing. I question how, when the Premier won his leadership on a ranked ballot system. And without it, I may very well be asking Premier Elliott a question right now. But I guess the Premier is actually just a little confused about how he actually ended up in the position that he is in. And just because they're confusing for him doesn't mean he can, should scrap them for all the people who, in Ontario who actually understand them and support them. Why is the government Question. using the pandemic to get rid of ranked ballots when voters in Kingston voted massively in favour of them? Thank you, Speaker. Member for Milton, Parliamentary Assistant. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. Mr. Speaker, let me get this uh, on the record, Mr. Speaker. 443 out of the 444 municipalities in Ontario during the last 2018 municipal election used the first-past-the-post system. Mr. Speaker, the City of London was the only municipality to have used ranked ballots in Ontario. And their municipal election, Mr. Speaker, get this, costed $515,000 more than the previous election. That's 40% higher, Mr. Order. Speaker. And Opposition to this, to order. Mr. Speaker, and they got the exact same election results that they would have under the previous system, Mr. Speaker. And I also like to remind the members, since he mentioned 
uh, City of Kingston. As outlined in the City's uh, staffing report in 2018, the City of K Spons. Kingston projected a 2022 municipal election would cost $1 million more, Mr. Speaker, under the rank balance. Mr. Speaker, we. Thank you. Thank you very much. Order. The House will come to order. The next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. I've been told that the Premier gave PC MPPs a For the People sign for their desks. After the Premier's latest attack on local democracy, I'm wondering if they've changed the signs to Doug Knows Best. The people of this province do not need the Premier to dictate to them how they should conduct local democratic elections. I'm confident the people can decide that themselves. And if they choose ranked ballots, they will choose a system that leads to more civility, something I believe we all need in politics. So, Speaker, my question is for the Premier. If ranked ballots are good enough to elect the Premier as leader of his party, why are they not good enough to elect mayors and municipal councillors? Never for Milton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I pointed out earlier, our proposed changes would bring predictability to municipal elections. It would bring consistency to municipal elections, and we would vote the same way federally, same way we would vote provincially, and the same way we would vote uh, municipally, Mr. Speaker. I am proud of the fact that our government has a collaborative relationship with municipal partners that is unprecedented in Ontario. Just this year, under the leadership of our Premier, Mr. Speaker, we signed a safe restart agreement Order. which will provide $4 billion in emergency funding to our municipal partners. Our government also passed legislation that gives municipalities more say on the locations of green energy products, projects and landfills. This collaborative spirit is not shared, obviously, by the opposition who voted Response. against all of these measures, unfortunately, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, I find the parliamentary insistence answer shocking. That the government actually thinks that they're going to impose on municipalities and take away their democratic right to determine how they're going to elect their local councils is just wrong. I'm also quite offended, Speaker, that the government keeps putting a price tag on democracy. Democracy, it cheapens democracy to do that. You know, the fixed cost for the ranked ballot elections in London Question. were 10 cents an, ele an elector. 10 cents an elector. So, the, can the parliamentary assistant, through you, Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant explain to the people of Ontario how 10 cents is too much to spend on improving democracy? Order. Parliamentary assistant, reply. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the member opposite for that question. And for the member's benefit, Mr. Speaker, let me translate what 10 cents elector looks like in real dollars, order. Mr. Speaker. That works out to $515,000 additional cost. That is 40% higher. Mr. Speaker, literally to receive the exact same result that they would have received under the previous Member process, for Waterloo, Mr. Come Speaker. To order. What we're trying to do on this side of the Member House for Davenport, is come make to order. the process consistent. This is exactly how we vote in our federal elections. This is the same way we vote in our provincial election, and it will be the same way that Order. voters in Ontario can vote in a municipal election while respecting the taxpayers' dollars, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member for Kingston and the Islands, come to order. The next question, the member for Mississauga, Erin Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When the province previous Liberal government was in power, they spent a lot of time tooting their carbon tax, but had very little to show for it in terms of real environment outcomes. Ontarians weren't fooled. They knew that this previous Liberal government's carbon tax was nothing more than government cash grabs that did a little to protect our environment or prepare us for the future impact of climate change. In fact, even the Liberals' own environment minister said that their 2017 pricing scheme was not a real solution to address Canada's greenhouse gas emissions 
or meaningful address the issue of Ontario changing climate. Mr. Speaker, Ontario has lacked clear directions when it comes to fighting climate change, and this is all thanks to the previous Liberal government, Question. backed by NDP, who cared more about frivolously spending taxpayers' dollars than coming up with a strategy. If there is a general consensus, it seems about finding effect and affordable ways to tackle Thank you. Thank you. The response? Minister of the Environment. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for Mississauga Air Mills for the, for the question. And Mr. Speaker, my ministry is committed to achieving Ontario's emission reductions target and preparing for the impacts of climate change, and we will continue to work hard towards this in a way that is transparent and respectful, respectful of hard-earned taxpayer dollars. We announced that we would be introducing an important initiative, the first-ever broad multi-sector climate impact assessment to better understand where and how climate change is likely to affect communities, economies, and the natural environment. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the importance of gathering expertise to make more informed decisions, and we have selected a consulting team led by the Climate Risk Institute to conduct the province's first-ever multi-sector climate change impact assessment. As part of this work, Mr. Speaker, the Institute will be reviewing Response. a variety of information such as climate data, land and use patterns, and social economic uh, projections. Mr. Speaker, this will serve as our foundation to develop appropriate climate change resilient measures. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thanks, Minister. Ontario climate is changing with more frequent and extreme events such as severe rain, ice, and wind storms, prolonged heat waves, and milder winters. Climate change should not be made a partisan issue, and instead of crusading against the government, both the Liberals and NDP should step up to the plate so that we can work together to ensure that Ontario maintain both a healthy environment and a healthy economy. Mr. Speaker, the people of Ontario want a government that prioritize real action that will lead Ontario fight against climate change and make up for years of neglect by the previous government. They want a plan that will protect and prepare communities from impact of extreme weather events. So, can Question. the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks tell us how exactly the impact assessment will take into account the different environmental considerations of all provinces, regions or communities? Minister to reply. Uh, thanks again for that question from the member. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in 2018, uh, insured damage for severe weather events across Canada reached $1.9 billion. The Insurance Bureau of Canada estimates that for every dollar uh, paid out by an insurance claim for homes and businesses, Canadian governments pay out $3 uh, to recover public infrastructure damaged by these uh, severe weather. We know that we need to strengthen the province's resilience to the impacts of climate change, and we recognize that in order to do that, we need to find the environmental approach that fits all provinces, regions, and communities. The climate change impact assessment will examine the unique geographies, economies, municipalities, and communities of the province. It will also examine the impact on a number of key themes, including infrastructure, food and agriculture, people and communities, natural resources, ecosystems and the environment, and businesses and the Response. economy. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to promoting integrated, tangible environmental solutions that tackle climate change, address local priorities, and support communities as they work to do their part. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. Nelson is a grade 8 student in my riding who is in virtual school. Nelson has ADHD and has been doing brilliantly in a program that ensures that he has lots of one-on-one -on -one time with a teacher or EA and that allows him to follow his IEP. As of today, however, Nelson still doesn't have a teacher in his online class. And that means that either his parents have to stop their work to act as his teacher, or he joins a regular class of 35 kids without the attention or the IEP that he needs. It is almost November, and this is brutally unfair to Nelson and his family. What is this government going to do to ensure that Nelson gets the education he needs and deserves? Thank you. Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you for the question, Speaker. The basis of the question underscores the importance of quality in teaching. It's why just days ago the Premier 
supported by the trustees, public school board associations, and parent councils have rescinded Regulation 274 to allow the principals of those schools to hire expeditiously because, as the member noted, that child should have a teacher. I think we all endeavour to ensure a child at this juncture has an educator to lead them in instruction. I, I understand the frustration of that parent and of the member opposite. It's why we gave our school boards an additional influx of money, uh, another $100 million to hire more educators. It's why school boards have hired north of 2,000 educators. And if we seek to assist school boards in hiring people for promotion or hiring them for supply, we should ask our federation partners, and I asked the member in her supplemental to agree, that Response? we should rescind the 50-day rule to allow retirees back into the classroom after firm opposition by the Ontario Federation of Teachers. Supplementary question, the member for Davenport. Mr. Speaker, the minister, and I'm gonna, my question is back to the premier, but this minister thinks they've done enough? He is completely ignoring the stress that students and parents and teachers have been put under when it comes to online learning. In the community of Goulet River, north of Sault Ste. Marie, parents are still driving their students to the schoolyard to access the internet so kids can download their lesson. As we heard, students in Toronto are still waiting for teachers to be assigned to them for virtual learning as of last week and despite registering in August. Teachers, I, I want to share one other one. Bella, Bella in grade four has to stay home because of an autoimmune issue. I just heard from her parents today. Her teacher is spending 90% of her time helping little kids to, to deal with their tech issues rather than teaching the curriculum. Question. Teachers are trying their best to make this work for students, but they're being forced into some impossible positions thanks to this government's lack of support. Speaker, while the government sits on over $9 billion in COVID relief money, families are struggling with off online learning. When are they going to act to support them? Thank you. Minister of Education. Speaker, the member opposite solution is not to enhance online learning. It's actually to scrap it all together. And for Bella's parents, I wonder if they knew that her member would rather her not even have the choice of online learning, how she would feel knowing that that child clearly ought to be home given her own personal circumstance. It is this government who stood alone. Order. It is this government who stood alone in the defense of online learning and the negotiations. We created an online learning system that has not and never been created in the province or in this country. We lead. The Premier has for Davenport, a commitment order. to innovation and pedagogy by providing parents a credible online learning program. We mandated funding training of every educator. We provided $69 million to hire virtual principals. We provided $30 the member for Davenport to procure come to order. over 30,000 new te pieces of technology, and we've ensured internet for is Sarnia extended Lampton, come to, to order. every school by next September. We are firmly committed to this digital pivot. We will do everything Response. we can to support our school boards. And we will the House will come to order. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. There are still seven homes with double-digit COVID-19 cases, long-term care homes in Ontario, today. And yesterday, the Minister said that long-term care residents were not being moved out of crowded homes and four-bed ward rooms because, and I quote, they have a moral right to their home. A moral right to their home. And then she also said, we considered decanting residents decanting. I didn't think the minister could exceed comparing COVID-19 to a bad flu season, but she succeeded. So Fairview Nursing Home right now is putting up wall dividers between COVID-positive residents and COVID-negative residents. Wall dividers. So the minister couldn't answer yesterday whether she thought that was a question. safe practice. And given her training, I would expect that she'd be able to answer that question easily. So does the minister think that putting up wall dividers is the safest way to protect residents from the spread of COVID-19? Government House Leader. Clearly, Mr. Speaker, the member would, uh, would uh, can appreciate uh, uh, that the government inherited a system uh, after 15 years that was in peril. Uh, and I know to the residents of that, uh, of that nursing home, uh, it doesn't matter to them that the government inherited a broken system. It doesn't matter to them that the previous government hadn't made investments in long-term care uh, for many years. What they want is their government to move quickly to take action. That is exactly what we did when it came to long-term care, Mr. Speaker, before the pandemic hit, and is what we're doing after the pandemic hit. To the member's question, is it, is it the best choice? 
Obviously not, Mr. Speaker. But that's not what we want. We want a system that treats all our seniors properly. That is why we are building so many long-term care homes in this province. That is why we moved to Ontario Health Teams, a blanket of care for our seniors, whether it's in the hospital, long-term care, whether it's home care. We want the best system Response. possible, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to work on that, uh, Mr. Speaker, despite having inherited a system that was so broken. The supplementary question. If it's not the best choice, then maybe you could have planned for another. So in Ottawa's West End Village, where 20 residents have died since September, and I mentioned it yesterday, a, a home that's less Order. than 15 minutes drive from the minister's constituency office. Donna Mavis was told by West End Villa that she couldn't take her sister June out of the home early in the summer. In August, June got COVID-19. She survived. But here's what June said. People were dying all around me. It was frightening. After this months-long struggle, June went home yesterday. So since the minister wants to talk about the moral rights of residents, through you, Speaker, what is the minister's Question. moral obligation to the residents of a West End villa? Thank you. The government house leader. Speaker, I would. I would suggest to the member that it is the obligation of all members of this legislature, all of us who have been elected to this place, to do our best to make sure that the people of the province of Ontario, whether they're seniors in long-term care homes, patients in our hospitals, receive the top, the best care that they possibly can, Mr. Speaker. It is without a doubt we inherited a system that was broken, but that that is what we started off almost immediately, Mr. Speaker, after the 2018 election to fix with significant, significant new funding for our long-term care homes. When the pandemic hit, in fact, before the pandemic hit, the Minister of, of Health brought in place a new system of Ontario health teams to provide a blanket of care because we knew that there were shortcomings in the system that were left to us by the previous Liberal government. To, so his constituent, June, I say to you, I am very sorry. I am very sorry on behalf of all parliamentarians. Response. You expected better, and we are doing all that we can to ensure that you get better. It is not just about money. It's not just about new builds. It's not just about PSWs. It is about a commitment to making sure that long-term care is the best that it can be for now and into the future. We won't let them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next question, the member for University of Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The TTC must purchase more buses, streetcars and subways to provide service and address overcrowding, and the decision on how much they're going to purchase is today. Here's the problem. The TTC doesn't have enough money to buy the vehicles it needs. Toronto needs 1,400 buses, but it can only afford 300. Toronto needs 80 subway cars, but it's ordering none. None. Because this government is refusing to pay its fair share and help out. Toronto has come to the table, the federal government has come to the table, but this government is nowhere. Premier, can you commit today to helping the TTC buy the vehicles our city needs so transit riders can get from A to B at an affordable price? The Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I think it's unequivocal. Uh, the fact that the Premier has been the strongest advocate for public transportation in the province of Ontario. We are investing $28.5 billion to expand our subway system, and not to, not to mention the fact that the Premier himself stood with conviction to negotiate a good deal for Ontario. When the members opposite accused him to give, him, to give in, he did not. He negotiated further, which led to $4 billion being provided to municipalities with up to $2 billion uh, provided to transportation uh, agencies to support them during this difficult time. The member for Thunder Bay, Atticokan, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The workers at the Bombardier plant in Thunder Bay need our help. Hundreds have been laid off and more jobs losses are coming. Toronto needs more transit vehicles and we can build them in my riding. That's a made in Ontario solution right in front of us. With provincial funding, Toronto's order would be much bigger, and that means more jobs. Yes, this government has dropped the ball on funding. They have been silent. I've asked this question before, but it needs to be asked again. When will this government finally step up and fund the much-needed Toronto Transit vehicles orders for Bombardier workers uh, so that they can keep their jobs? Thank you. 
the Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much to the member for the question. Something that is very important to us, all of our colleagues, and particularly our colleagues in Northern Ontario, is the pre preservation uh, of good, well-paying jobs. Mr. Speaker, Metrolinx put in an order earlier this year uh, to the tune of $100 million for additional GO Transit cars. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have invested a historic amount in public transportation across the province of Ontario, uh, which will certainly require additional vehicles, additional fleet uh, to service, and we will continue to collaborate with the City of Toronto and York Region to start construction as quickly as possible so that we can continue to order additional vehicle and fleet. Thank you. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. In February, this government created a task force to provide specific recommendations to change Ontario's publicly traded stock market and capital markets. The task force was called the Capital Markets Modernization Task, task Force and was chaired by downtown Toronto lawyer Waleed Solomon, who practices in special situations. In July of 2020, the task force released the 47 proposals it provided to this government. On September 3rd, 2020, the Canadian Securities Administrators, whose mandate is to harmonize capital markets across Canada, responded with their concerns that the task force ignored having Ontario adopt the passport system that harmonizes our capital markets with the rest of the countries and also identified 10 proposals it had concerns with. Can the minister tell us if he plans on adopting all 47 proposals put forward by his task force that was chaired by Mr. Solomon? Minister of Finance to reply. Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the member for the question, and, and this, uh, this work is important work, and I appreciate her giving me an opportunity to highlight it. Ontario's capital markets are an important part of the infrastructure of our success, not just now, in the future. And our government recognized that the evolution of those capital markets, as with the evolution of capital markets globally, uh, was, uh, was a, an important area of focus, and that's why we did appoint the task force. Uh, that task force has provided preliminary recommendations, but as is our approach uh, in government, we wanted to make Make sure we consulted. So I ask that the broader community, including the uh, the national regulator, have the opportunity to comment on that. We're awaiting uh, the uh, the final comments, uh, and we'll look to those recommendations. But Mr. Speaker, the work of the Capital Markets Task Force uh, is aligned to the idea of this government. We want to create an environment where uh, capital can be raised, Response. but also where investors can be protected. And uh, when those recommendations are final, I uh, I am sure that I'll bring them back to the House, and I'll look forward to it. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you. As a woman of mixed ethnicity, I found one proposal of the task force curious. The minister previously stated that the goal of the task force was to reduce regulatory burdens. Proposal 19 of the task force calls for the Ontario government to adopt a policy introduced earlier this year by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's federal government. This proposal calls for government-mandated gender and race quotas that all companies listed on the stock market would have to comply with. The task force also calls for 10-year term limits of corporate directors. The suggestion being that people like me, can't make it onto a corporate board without your help. This specific proposal would actually increase regulatory burdens on companies listed on the stock market rather than reduce them. Can the minister tell us whether he will be moving forward with this new regulatory burden on business and apply government-mandated gender and race quotas that all companies listed on the stock market Question. would have to abide by? Minister of Finance. No, Mr. Speaker, I, and again, I appreciate the chance the, the, the uh, member highlighted the members of the task force. I'd like to do so as well. Cindy Tripp, who was the founding partner and managing director of GMP Securities. Melissa Kennedy, who was the chief legal officer at Sun Life. Wes Hall, uh, founder of the uh, and executive chair of Kingsdale Advisors and the founder of the Black North Initiative as well. Rupert Dershame, a former CEO at, at AMIA, and also, of course, Waleed Solomon, as she's mentioned. Mr. Speaker, all these recommendations um, Come uh, before will come before the, uh, the, uh, the minister. We will see what the recommendations back from the broader community are. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, I think it's important that we look at all of these options. Uh, they con they are contained in a very consultative report, and uh, and we'll present them uh, when they're ready and uh, look forward to reforming the capital markets. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. St. Catharines. Close to <laughs> Just down the highway. Thank you, Speaker. The former GM plant site in my riding of St. Catharines is being tested for toxic materials for the second time. The residents of St. Catharines had to wait almost six months, six months, for the results of this testing. A study that found high levels of carcinogenic PCBs leaking into the 12 Mile Creek. These new tests need to be expedited. Concerned residents of St. Catharines deserve up to date information. 
Will this ministry commit to expediting tests for the former GM lands in St. Catharines to provide the answers to the neighbourhoods in the area? Mr. The Environment. Thank you very much. Uh, from member opposite uh, for that question and uh, we had a quick conversation yesterday regarding that and I know uh, you had a meeting with uh, ministry staff the other day regarding uh, the the GM property and you know the health and safety of Ontarians is front and foremost in the ministry environment and we're going to continue to support the city of St. Catharines uh, in addressing the residents concerns uh, we are uh, conducting water sampling uh, we're taking air uh, sampling as well um, and uh, we're looking for impacts uh, in the downstream in which we'll act if there are some that are, are, are beyond uh, uh, legal limits. Uh, we are planning additional water sampling in the areas following a rainfall, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to do so to ensure that in collaboration with the City of St. Catharines, um, we will continue uh, our monitoring of the situation to ensure that the residents uh, around the area, including all the residents of St. Catharines area, are, are maintained and, and kept safe, uh, and ensuring that the environmental standards set forth by the Government of Ontario are held to the highest. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Number Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. Um, concerned residents are asking for asbestos testing to be done on the grounds and the water surrounding the former GM site. Everyone sitting on that side of the house knows how deadly asbestos is and how just one interaction with it can lead to lifelong problems and can be fatal. The Minister of Environment has said it is the responsibility of the Minister of Labour. The Minister of Labour has said they cannot investigate unless the site is active. Which ministry will it be? The residents of St. Catharines deserve a better answer. The residing residents want the former GM property cleaned up and rid of contamination. The mayor and the city councillors want the former GM lands cleaned up once and for all. Above all, Question. the community, the residents, have raised concerns about asbestos poisoning. Will this government commit here today to make an expeditional uh, an exception, sorry, to include asbestos in their water testing so that the residents and the city of St. Catharines could move forward and development can please take place. Thank you. And the Minister of the Environment reply. Uh, thanks again for that question. And, uh, you know, we're more than uh, willing to continue to work with the city of St. Catharines uh, on the issues surrounding the GM site. Uh, we do have uh, uh, air monitoring to as assess for asbestos. Uh, coming from the dust piles and the rubbles, and Mr. Speaker, she's member opposite is correct. It, it, it's it's not a labor issue if there's no work being done on the site, and uh, we will uh, work with the city of St. Catharines and GM uh, to ensure if if the land comes up for sale that the record of site condition is is at uh, above board standards. And I'm more than happy to uh, sit down and meet. Uh, uh, with the Mayor of St. Catharines to have a further discussion on this issue as how we could support the City of St. Catharines ensuring the GM site is safe for the residents of, of St. Catharines. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.